Imagine a mighty civilization, both feared and admired by its subjects, dominating swathes of the American land. Think glorious palaces, masterful engineering feats, and a bureaucracy so efficient it makes Bismarck's Prussia look like faulty towers. Now imagine the same civilization without the wheel. Minimal use of draft animals, no gunpowder, no steel nor iron tools, no mortar and not even a writing system. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the glorious Inca Empire. As we well know, the absence of the seemingly fundamental aspects of 16th century civilization either justified or directly contributed to the Spanish conquest. Conquest over a mummy-worshipping state without a writing system. Or so the Spanish colonizers would have us believe. Join us at Intrigue Mind and journey with us to delve into one of the greatest mysteries of the ancient South American world. Now what if we were to tell you that the Spanish knew of a certain recording apparatus? A certain device which stored and communicated crucial information across the vast Inca Empire. And that these devices encoded the culture and history of the Inca people, as well as the information which kept the empire's administration afloat. Sounds like something the Spanish would want to destroy, no? Well, they did. At least they tried to. They also killed with their European germs, or Toledan steel swords, the majority of the state workers who could make and intercept them. The device's knowledge died along with them. The device is the quipu. Named after the Quechua word for not, the quipu is one of the most enigmatic features of pre-Hispanic America and is basically, well, a bunch of strings. It consists of a long textile cord or sometimes even a wooden burr from which hang a varying number of strings, sometimes as many as 1,500. These pendant strings came into a wide variety of colors, lengths, knot types and knot positions. The strings are usually arranged into clear groups, separated by a space or color change. The pendant strings may also have smaller strings tied to them, called subsidiary strings, believed to indicate exceptions or data of secondary importance. Back to the pendant strings, the knots, positioning, the total number of knots and their sequence could all combine to create an infinite number of meanings just like words in a sentence. But the most common of these, and one which we have the most conclusive research, relate to algebra. Up to the late 20th century, experts considered the quipu to be an accounting tool, and indeed it was. These nifty, highly portable strings were used by the empire's quipu kamayok, or not readers, whenever they were record keeping. See, the Inca had an impressive, highly efficient taxation system involving the collection of goods in kind, which were then stored in tremendous warehouses along the great Inca highway. Agricultural produce, clothes, textiles and ceramics were often distributed to different parts of the empire, so famine and want could always be averted and the effects of natural disasters alleviated. Basically, Marx would have been impressed. Of course, the grease of this well-oiled machine was the humble accountant and his quipu. How would he keep track of the peanuts, pots and potatoes coming in and out of his warehouse? This is where the knots are crucial because they have numeric value. We know that there were three types of knots and these had different mathematical meanings. These were single knots, long knots, and figure of eight knots. A single knot represented 10, or a power of 10, so 100, 1000, with the largest decimal number used being 10,000. The larger the power of 10, the closer the knot to the main chord, which is the one shown horizontally. So, for example, take one string, three single knots found furthest away from the main chord would represent 30. Two single knots closest to the top would be 2,000, or another higher power of 10. Long knots represented figures between 2 and 9. The number was indicated from the amount of times the knot was wrapped. Finally, the figure of 8 knot represented a value of 1, 
Congratulations on passing your first masterclass. But if you think that's the extent of the quipu's complexity, think again. Color, chord composition, ply, and length, not to mention the meaning of the subsidiary strings, remain subject to speculation. The most able mathematicians and cultural historians still haven't cracked the code. Yet, for these Inca accountants, this contraption was as mundane as bark on trees. Inca education for the elite class included one year of kipu study. The kipu kameyuk pursued something not too dissimilar to a doctorate in kipu craft before going out and serving the empire derogatively called bean counters. They might not have had the heroism or prestige of Inca warriors, but they certainly had much of the empire's weight on their shoulders. The system of values, procedures and practices which we're still trying to decipher was immensely complex. Yet, lapse of memory during record-keeping or teaching could be severely punished. They also doubled as tax collectors, so could hardly have been the most popular of imperial servants, particularly in the more remote parts of the empire. Recent excavations at a warehouse complex in Incahuasi, Peru, revealed a grid-like array of squares marked in the sand, each about 23 centimeters by 23. It's believed the squares serve to standardize measurements for tribute. Farmers would trudge for miles to the designated warehouse with their tribute loaded onto llama pack trains. There they were greeted by an accountant, which would have looked like a bundle of colored spaghetti in his hands, and told to spread the tribute evenly along certain squares. The quipus were completed, duplicates were likely made, and then sent to Cusco by means of formidable shasky runners. Meanwhile, the disgruntled farmer shuffles back to his alu or kin community, knowing he'd have to make the same journey again for the next tax season. This paints one imagined scene in 15th century Inca life, but the quipu's role is believed to extend beyond tribute records, encompassing land measurements, censuses, military equipment, army sizes, astronomy, among other things. What's more, the quipu, and this is the haziest aspect of the research, has other meanings beside numeric ones. Though the shift of research focus has only occurred recently, it has long been known that at least 20% of the knots of the quipu were discovered not to have numerical value. In the late 1970s, British engineer William Burns Glynn formulated his incredible theory that there was an Inca alphabet. He posited that the alphabet made up only 10 consonants, was represented not as letters, but as pictographs on Inca textiles, ceramics and stones. Central to his theory was that the Inca transcribed the sounds of the consonants into numbers, based on findings from colonial era chronicles. Since the Inca had a base 10 number system, it's possible the quipu's knots represented the 10 consonants of the Inca alphabet. And if the theory holds true, quipus store valuable encoded messages, which, if cracked, would give immeasurable insight into the ancient Andean world through the lens of the Inca. The findings were backed up by the chronicles. Spanish scribes mentioned the quipu contained historical and political information. And in one famous chronicle by Giram Poma de Alia, the Inca's secretary is described as he who records the words of the Inca. Inca ballads, poems, myths, history and bloodlines possibly make up the quipus' threads and knots. For now, over 1,000 quipus survive in museums and private collections around the world. After the conquest in 1532, the Spanish sought to destroy any trace of the quipu. The traditional narrative up to now is that they destroyed anything that reeked of uncivilization or paganism. But could there have been other motives? Other motives like, say, wiping out the memory of a civilization? Only time can tell. Research of the quipu is ongoing. The Peru's dry coastal climate means more and more well-preserved quipu are being unearthed and studied. Cracking the code means opening the door to a lost world and understanding it from the perspective of those who lived it. 
For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video and leave your suggestions in the comments below.